now the faculty lecture with Dan Garcia, teaching professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I can't wait to tell you about parallel programming, multi-core machines, the history behind it. Let's jump right in and get started. This is, I've got a lot to cover. So I go to a computer and I, and I see I want to buy a new fancy computer. And they, they say this, well, you can buy this with this many cores, eight cores or 16 cores. And I'm asking myself, what's a core anyway? This is crazy. So I looked at my Mac and I said, about the Mac. And I looked very carefully and it said, my Mac is an eight core machine. And I want to know, what does that mean? That's the purpose of this lecture, to teach what that is. So these are the five parts of a computer. This is called the von Neumann architecture, although you don't really have to remember that. The five parts of a computer are starting on the right, all the way over there on the right, input and output. Input. You got a mouse. You got a keyboard. You got maybe a trackpad. You got some, some other, maybe the network. Output, well, that's your display, maybe also the network, maybe a printer, maybe a robot. Then you've got memory. So if you want, buy, you want to make your computer much faster, buy a lot of memory. So memory is where stuff is stored temporarily. It's the storage for bytes, data temporarily on your computer. And then you've got the processor. And the processor is made up of two parts. It has a data path and a control. Data path is like the wiring, and control is like the marionette that turns on the sluices to make the wiring go, okay, the data go this way, and now the data is going to go that way, and that's the purpose of the control. And so that's the idea. That's the processor. And that, and the way the processor interacts with the input-output is it has to go through memory. That's interesting. So that's the way a computer works. These are five, five parts of the computer called the von Neumann architecture. Now, let's go take, take, a, like a, take a trip down memory, or actually processor lane. Back in the day, this is back in the, this is a beautiful graph, this publicly available data, 1975. And by the way, this is a beautiful graph. It's linear in time along the, along the bottom axis. Along the y-axis, this is exponential, okay? So it's 10 to the 0 or 1, 10 to the 1 is 10, 10 to the 2 is 100, 10 to the 3 is 1,000, et cetera. Okay, if we look at how many transistors we were able to pack onto a processor, well, if you think about a linear log plot, a straight line is really an exponential growth. Think about it, right? 75, it was about, you know, it was a handful, and now 85, it's now it's grown, and it continues, it continues. This is called Moore's Law. Moore didn't predict it. Moore was saying, this is what I'm noticing, but then the whole computer engineering industry basically said, we're going to try to keep up with Moore's Law. And he first saw it, said that the number of processors on a chip the number of it, transistors on an integrated circuit will, the process is later, <laughs> transistors on an integrated circuit is what we're looking at, will double every two years. And then he actually, notice there's a kink in the curve right over here, right over there, whoops, right there. It turns out that it started to double every 18 months. This is amazing. So we love this. This is why we have all the electronics we have today. Remarkable drones and fast computers, all thanks to Moore's Law. So thank you, Mr. Moore, for predicting this and helping guide our industry forward. Here's power. Now, power is in watts. Power is like a light bulb. Okay, power is how much power you take, how much energy is being used over time. So if you look over here, you see a processor started to take up to 100 watts, 200 watts, 400 watts. They couldn't keep them cool. This is a bad thing. So the power got so high that in 2005, they really had an issue. They could not keep these cool. By the way, processors are only about the size of a postage stamp. Imagine 100 watts in this little postage stamp. I mean, it's too hot to touch. You could boil it, you know, you could fry an egg on it. It's crazy. So that was a problem. So what did they do? Well, the clock frequency is how fast the heartbeat is of a computer. And so it was going up also exponentially. Back in the day, boy, we had, I got a 250 megahertz. There's a 250 million times a second the clock's going up and down. And then, oh, I got 500 megahertz. I've got a gigahertz. I've got a 2 gigahertz. I've got a 4 gigahertz. Four, that's 4 billion times a second the clock is going up and down. That's a lot. It's really fast. So they decided 
we have to turn the clock. We can't continue to exponentially increase. We've got to flatten it. And so right now, back in 2005, the fastest clock rate was around 3 or 4 gigahertz. Guess what? We're 2021. Still the same clock rate. 3 or 4 gigahertz is the fastest one. So they flattened it. Well, when you flatten the frequency, we were kind of getting a benefit. Oh, great. Now the power's flattened. Okay, that's great. Still hot. It's still really hot, but it's not continuing to grow. So we can keep it cool. And people had very arcane ways of keeping processors cool. Liquid cooled and you know oil cooled and lots of crazy fan designs. It was really hard. Cooling the processor was the big challenge, engineering challenge. Well, what happens when you stop increasing the clock rate? You don't get this free boost of power. If the, if the machine's just going faster just because the, heart's going, the heart rate's going faster, you're just going to get a benefit of power, a benefit of sequential app performance. When I say sequential, I mean no parallelism, just a single processor just running a single program, Okay, not, not trying to split it up into different sub-problems. Well, that started to plateau also. This is really bad. We can't have single app performance plateau. So what did they do? they decided to go parallel. They decided to include multiple cores. And once you include multiple cores, guess what you got? The parallel app performance continues to rise. So that's what's able to make all the games and you know, big 4K screens playing 4K movies from YouTube. The reason we are able to have that hungry appetite satisfied is we're able to go parallel. And basically since 2005, everything is parallel. Laptops, uh, cell phones, uh, my watch, my Apple Watch is parallel. It's got multiple cores in there. It's a little crazy. So that's how we're able to continue to satisfy the appetite for these power and compute hungry applications. So let's go back to our picture. Here's our laptop computer. But now we're going to call, rather than just calling it a processor, we're going to call it a core. And look at this. Now you'll see there's a second core. And what's also interesting, we didn't double the memory. And by the way, now there's two cores and four cores and eight cores. And by the, way, the highest end, I think it's 28 cores. Wow. But they all have a shared memory. Can you see the problem there? Well, they're each, it's almost like two people eating off the same plate. You know, sometimes you, you grab the same piece of data. Sometimes you put data, maybe you're reading and writing. I usually don't put food back on a plate. Maybe it's not the best anal analogy. But the idea is you have this shared thing, a shared, maybe, maybe, maybe a shared piece of paper, and you're writing and reading on it, and you're going to maybe overwrite each other's data. That could be an issue. So you really have to watch out when you write parallel programs to make sure they don't clobber each other and also don't have something called a race condition where you both race into the same spot and whoever gets there first wins, but it's, it's unclear who's going to get there first, and so you might have bad data. So all those things are, are issues when you have multi-core computing. So parallel processing, let's take a step back. It's really hard. It's inevitable because we had to do that because we couldn't keep our chips cool. We had to go parallel to keep the compute-hungry application satisfied. It's the only way to increase performance. I said that. And by the way, we improve battery life. By not continuing to have the power go up, we don't have to keep this stuff cool, and our battery is happier. So now we can actually have, you know, nowadays uh, laptops can go for what, 10 hours, 12 hours, thanks to going parallel and turning the clock rate down. And also being clever about it, they have some high-performance processors. They actually customize them and low-performance ones. And when you don't need to have a crazy workload, they use the really efficient low-performance ones. But when you have to do some game and you got to do a quick-time movie or something, they'll kick in the high-performance. So they're actually quite clever about having those. So in mobile systems like phones and tablets, and you're going to have multiple cores. You're also going to have dedicated other processors, maybe dealing with motion or image processing or neural processing, thinking about how to handle uh, machine learning programs all locally on your mobile device. Pretty powerful. You're also going to have a graphics processing unit, which is going to handle the drawing of the screen and doing some of that, and also some of the work as well. So you're asking yourself, are two cores twice as fast? Good question to ask. I, I hate to be the one to tell you this. I'm going to teach you about Amdahl's heartbreaking law. This is such a sad law, to have, but it's life. I've got to share the life. The speed up that can be achieved through parallelism is limited by a serial portion of your program. All right, look at this picture right here. Imagine you got a problem, and you're going to try to solve it, and you might have some part of the problem that can be solved kind of in parallel, but some part that just can't be parallelized. So what we're going to say is we're going to say 100% is the whole total. However much time it takes, let's say it's an hour, call that 100%. And if I have just one processor right here, I'm going to think, okay, well, I have some fraction blue that's serial and some fraction yellow that's parallel. And as I increase more processors, notice I go to two, the yellow part cut in half. 
want to go to three processors, the yellow part got to thirds. And if you keep doing this, the yellow part keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until if you have an infinite number of processors, the yellow part goes away altogether. So the speed up of anything is the time, the speed up, I'm going to walk to school and then ride a bike. What's the speed up? Well, first time yourself walking to school and then time yourself riding a bike and divide those. That's how. You, that's typically how you do these things. So if we're going to add the parallelism and add, measure what the speed up of the parallelism is, we divide the time, in just the sequential model with only one processor, divided by the time if you have some more than one processor. Now remember, we're going to call this max of the time right here for one, we're going to call that 100%. So that's really one. We're normalizing that to one, okay? And S, this is a fraction. Once this goes to here to all the way here and there's no more yellow, the only thing you're left is this blue. And what's the blue? It's just S. S is a fraction, like a quarter or a half or a tenth. So the speed up is no better than one over S. And you're like, well, that seems pretty good. Maybe we can get a good number, except that let's look at this graph over here. That graph says, by the way, the graph talks about parallel portions, but S and P are kind of, they both add to one. So they're, you know, they're both related in that way. So let's say we work really hard so that we have half of our program is parallel. Well, that means half of it is serial. Remember our equation, one over S, one over a half. You take the fraction, you flip it. When you take one over a fraction, you flip it. So it's two over one. So you only get two times speed up. Wait, you're telling me if I have a billion processors, I can only get two times speed up? Yep, sorry. Even if you had a billion processors and that yellow part goes to zero, that S, which is half of the work, doesn't go away. So you're only, you know, think of it, right? Imagine, imagine this. Imagine it takes two hours for the whole thing. That's just two hours. And, and this is half in here, half, in, half yellow, half blue. Well, okay, two hours for the whole thing. That's, the, that's time sequential is two, okay? Sequen now, once the yellow part goes away, so once the, yellow pa the parallel part goes away, you're left with the one hour here. Two over one is two. See? So two. Oh, gosh. All right. How about that? Anyway? What if I work really hard to have 75% parallel? Well, that means uh, that's three quarters. That means a quarter is serial. Well, you invert a quarter and it becomes four. I only get four times. Isn't that crazy? It's just heartbreaking. So you bought a million. I bought a really, I put all the money in my whole life into a billion processors, a billion workers to help me with. By the way, this is about life. This isn't just a process. I could have a billion workers helping me, but if my problem can't be divided any better than 75% 75 parallel, meaning a quarter serial, I can no, get no better than four times speed up. How about 90% parallel? Well, that's 10%. That's 10% serial, one tenth. Invert one tenth, you get 10, only 10 times faster. How about 95% parallel? That's pretty good. Well, that means one fifth or one twentieth is serial. Invert that, that's only 20 times. So this is heartbreaking. But it gets even worse. <laughs> even assuming there's no sequential portion. Well, no sequential, one over nothing. That could be infinite speed up. Well, not so much, not so fast. You got the time it takes to divide the problem up. You're thinking about it, you got to think about how to divide the problem up. How much, how do you divide this up? Imagine I've got a lot of people helping me dig a ditch. Okay, I got to hand out the shovels maybe to work units to the volunteers. All the workers may not work equally fast. Some of them might fail. Some of them might not take a break. Some computers might fail. Some networks might fail. You got to always deal with reality. So again, I'm never going to get that perfect one over S because of all the things I'm listing here. Maybe contention for shared resources. Remember that memory? All those cores are fighting for this. Maybe they're fitting for the same exact memory spot. They got to wait for each other there. Now you've got a parallel. Now you can't have them in parallel because they're taking turns. That. That's even worse. They could be overriding each other's answers. You got to double check that. Make sure that doesn't happen. You have to wait until the last worker returns. You know, I, I hand all the shovels out and I'm waiting. I'm waiting on my clock. Okay, and there's one worker who's taking a break. Oh gosh, this is called the weakest link problem. I also have to take, somehow if I take the problem and break, let's say I'm doing some, some big letter and I'm dividing up into pieces and I send it out and I have to then send it back. I got to put the pieces back together. So I got time to take, imagine a big puzzle, you know, the big, you know, jigsaw puzzle. I got to put the pieces back together that, okay, thank you so much for doing your part, but I got to put it back together into the whole. All this is really hard. Whew, getting exhausted. But I want to show you a demo, possibly the greatest parallel demo, and you can try it yourself. I'll show you the URL with you. This is by my colleague at UC Berkeley, Pamela Fox. I'm so excited about this demo. Okay, here's how this works. The goal here is to recognize, do some kind of machine learning, and find out if artificial intelligence, if I can find, I'm going to look at pictures, I'm going to look at images, and I'm trying to find cats. 
okay? And it takes a lot of processing power to do that. And I'm going to try only one thread, which means kind of one processor. We call it a thread. We'll talk about that later. But it's one processor, okay? So one core. Really. I'm just doing one core, okay? And I would like to process all 44 images. How long should it take me? Here we go. It says I can run 16 of these at once. But I'm going to try it. Now let's try it. Okay, here's all my pictures. It might, it might not be perfect. And now every time you see, here, every time you see, I should almost make myself smaller. Every time you see a green square, that means it found a cat. Every time it says an X, it doesn't find it. It's not perfect. So there's a picture of a fox in here, and it actually thinks it's a cat when it's not. So again, we're trying our best, and there's only one worker bee. And we're going to see how long does it take, and then time it, and see when I go to two cores, do I get two times speed up? Let's actually take a look at this. So let's see what we got. Okay, I'm watching it here. It's really fun to watch. Oh, there it is. Right there. See that right there? It just found the fox. The one that was the fox sitting there right on this row right here, right here, right there. <laughs> There's a fox right here uh, in snow. And I thought it was a cat. Okay, how long is this taking? Okay, 42 seconds, about 43. Half of 43, I got 21.5. Okay, so let's now use two cores. Here we go. Okay, and now let's try it again. And we're going for 21.5. And watch. Oh, look at this beautiful visualization. Pamela is amazing. By the way, if you get to try this yourself, pamelafox.github.io slash parallel dash demo. Okay, we're looking for 21 and a half seconds. And look how much faster this is. And these two workers are working. And it's so beautiful. The visualization she created to show me how the workers are doing. I love this. This is so great. Can I get to 21.5? Oh, 22.5. I'm getting pretty close. 22.5. Okay. So there was some overhead. Maybe there's some Amdahl's law there. There's a little, notice, but see that main? See right here, that little blue part main? That wasn't in parallel. That was part of the serial part of the program. But the rest of it was all parallel. So again, there are some issues. I remember I could send the data back, send it coming over. That's why I didn't get to exactly 21.5. But 22.5 is pretty close. I'm feeling really good about this. Let's now go to four cores. And now I'm at 22.5. So I need to be getting, what's half of that? That's 11.25. Can I get to 11.25 for there? Okay, let's try it. And look how cool this visualization is. We're watching this in real time. Can I get to 11.25 seconds? Come on, but that main, boy, that main is starting to factor. I can't get, get around that. 11.2, ah, 12.73. See, I keep getting worse. That's not there. But I'm doing, I'm still pretty close. I'm still pretty close to being, you know, a perfect speed up. 12.73. So if I go up going, I'm looking at 6 and, you know, 6.4, 6.3 something. Okay, let's go to eight cores, eight actual cores. Here we go. We're looking for 6.3 something. Okay, here we go. Watch this, watch this. Look at eight workers. Look at this. this is so great. And remember, I'm 6.3 I'm looking for. Can I get to that? Here I go. 6.3. I'm so excited. Okay. Oh, look at this. 8.68. Now, there's an interesting feature, complicated even though I only have eight physical cores, I showed you the picture of my computer. It's my computer. You can actually run double the number of like workers. We call them threads. I can, you don't have to worry about that because sometimes with the same core, you can kind of be feeding two programs in at once and they both can, while well, one person's working on some part of it, like let's say this process, this one core is working on some part. The other guy can kind of, while they're still thinking about it, or maybe sending data to memory and waiting for memory, the other guy could be crunching on something. So that's kind of useful. So turns out we can actually run, it's called hyper-threading, twice as many threads, worker bees, as the number of cores. So I had eight cores, I can run 16 threads. Let's see what we got. Remember, 868, we did much worse in terms of our factor of two. Can I get to what I'm looking at? 4.35, okay? 4.3, something like that. Let's try it. Watch this. Look, 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 look. 16 worker bees. Now, remember, I really only have eight cores, but it's being clever in terms of trying to do this hyper-threading thing. So can I get to 8.2? Remember it was 8.4 something. I was trying to get four. I really didn't do well. So I, you notice the curve is going down, 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 down. And then I really lost that. So this was a really great demo. And I want to thank Pamela Fox for putting that online. She used to work for Khan Academy. And she built that as part of their Khan Academy's APCS Principles Programming Task. So I'm done. Thank you so much for coming to this lecture about parallel programming. We learned about, what did we learn? We learned about Amdahl's law, Amdahl's heartbreaking law. We learned about what cores are. We saw this amazing demo. I'm feeling pretty good about this. I'm feeling pretty good about thinking about how to understand how to buy a new computer, 
that I, I know that I'm not, as I continue to double my cores, I'm not going to get twice that performance. And maybe it isn't worth all the money you'd spend to do this. If you want to make your computer faster, put more memory in it because having to go to disk is really slow and memory is going to make your computer a lot faster. That's it. My name is Dan Garcia. I'm a teaching professor at UC Berkeley. I'm also the co-developer of the Beauty and Joy Computing Curriculum. Maybe some of you are in that class now. Anyway, great to see you all. Thank you for coming to my lecture and take care.